So, um, today uh, we're going to learn about Euclidean domains. I, I, I should start with saying that the last thing we did was showing that principal ideal domains Oof, nobody bothers with these words, they just APIDs um, are unique factorization domains or U of these. Um, so today, so that means, I guess that means that the polynomial rings are U of these. So, um, so Z is a U of D. Uh, we knew this since childhood. Polynomial ring over a field is a U of D. Uh, because we, we showed it's a principal ideal domain. And the question, um, and the thing is, what other PIDs do I know? Um, to apply this theorem to. And not that many um, yet. Today, I mean, there's not that many PIDs. Uh, the PIDs are so amazing. Uh, they're not that, uh, they're too good to be everywhere. But today, I'll tell you how to find a bunch of PIDs, um, which is by finding, uh, showing that they're Euclidean domains. So they're called Euclidean because um, these words mean that we can do the Euclidean algorithm. Basically, um, so what is a Euclidean domain? So definition. A Euclidean domain is an integral domain R together with a function. Um, so a function that we like to call new, I don't know why. Um, so for every element in the ring, except for zero, uh, we get we get a, a natural number. So it's kind of like we call it valuations, but if you think about it, about it as a measure of of size, um, with the following properties. <clears throat> so the first property is that if a b are non-zero the multiplying can only increase the valuation And the other property is that um, for any, again, a, b, non zero, there exists uh, q and r. Uh, such that a is q b plus r 
and either b divides a, so the remainder is zero, or the remainder became smaller than, uh, oh, than the denominator of the division. So these are the two properties. Um, these are the two properties that a Euclidean domain should have. We mark Michael new uh, Euclidean valuation. So the thing is, um, on a ring, there's no um, rings. What can you do with a ring? You can sum and you can multiply. And, and in principle, there's nothing else you can know about them. But then, so for, for example, you would like to do some sort of division. But, but the, the fundamental thing about division is that the remainder gets smaller than the denominator. Um, and, and rings don't come with a notion by themselves of what, what elements are smaller and bigger. Um, at least in principle, just knowing, just by knowing that they're rings, sometimes th there is that notion flowing around and we can sort of tack it onto a ring structure and that makes, it allows us to say the remainder is smaller. So for example, you could keep dividing and do the Euclidean algorithm. Uh, and that's what, that's what this is doing. That's what um, a Euclidean domain is kind of a ring where I can also tell you this element is smaller than this other element. Um, so, so what's a Euclidean? What's an example of a Euclidean domain? Which have Z mod P. Z mod P. Uh, well, that's not, I wasn't expecting that one. I don't know. So. Isn't it any field? Any field. Um. So, okay, so if you, if you tell me that Z map PZ is a Euclidean domain, you gotta tell me what the valuation is. How do I take, um, how do I take, for example, each, each uh, remainder in Z map PZ and, and assign a number to it? So how do I do that? I guess the remainder would be between zero and P minus one. Okay, so that is not gonna work. Uh, okay, uh, let, let's address the field thing after. So, that's gonna be that's gonna be a problem. That is not gonna work. Um, but let's see why. So, um, which of these properties fails? With um, this ring and this valuation, I guess if A and B are non-zero, then it's not necessarily true that. Uh... Like AB is greater than or equal to A because you could have that it's uh, less than. So, like, the, that property is violated. Right, exactly. Um, so, if you take, for example, so for, for example, uh, you, you know, if you multiply negative one by negative one. Uh, this is going to be one. 
which according to this rule has valuation one, um, but nu of negative one is b minus one, which is um, which is going to be bigger than one. I guess it does work if p is two. <clears throat> all right, um, all right. Uh, John gets the point. Uh, okay, so I mean, this is not the the most fascinating example, but it, it is true that any field. Okay, uh, I'm going to ask you what valuation to put on any field to to make it an a Euclidean domain. But while you think about it, I'm just going to copy the properties again. So think about what valuation you should give it. Would it be like a norm? A norm? Or I guess we haven't covered that in this class. Could it be the degree of the polynomial? But I'm over a field. Um, I feel like the rationals, the rationals don't have a degree. Just one? Just one, who said that? Mason. Mason, all right, you got to point Mason. Uh, that works, yeah. Uh, you make anything, so. So now, do I have that nu of a is smaller than nu of a b? So this is, I don't need to worry about zero here. So a and b are non zero. Their product is going to be non zero then, of course. Uh, this is true. It, both sides are just one. And if I take a and b non zero, how can I do division with remainder over a field? So over the rationals, what happens when you try to divide three by two? You automatically have a Q and a... So what's what's R? Zero. Zero, right. There, you can always divide with no remainder. So A is B times A over B plus zero. So there's never a remainder. So, so fields are Euclidean domains. Um, so I guess this was a good exercise. Uh, it's not, I mean, we're trying to understand factorization and factorization in fields is not very interesting because everything divides everything. Any, anything divides anything, so. All right, so. Uh, more examples. That are not fields. So by the way, Z mod PZ is a field. So if we had made everything go to one, that would have worked. Um, So the integers, the integers. Um, so the integers are in Euclidean domain. Uh, I mean, of course, the answer, I guess, will depend on the valuation. But what is the um, absolute value? Absolute value. <clears throat> so the requirements we said that the evaluation of anything would have to be a natural number. So. Were you going to say that, Tiago?
right i'll give you a chance next time um okay um so so you know very well that the integers are are you clean into mean the when you multiply two numbers the absolute value gets multiplied which is of course you're multiplying so here is multiplying by something that's at least one I, did i say uh, the valuation has to be at least one i don't want to get into the controversy of whether zero is a natural number or not people get very heated about that but i don't really care um but the valuation in, in uh, for for evaluation it can't be zero so um the product works and you know how to do division with remainder um and you could even you could even make the remainder negative and it would work All right, so I have another example uh, in mind of a Euclidean domain. Okay, so can someone tell me what it is? Someone who's not Mason or John who already got a point. Uh, C of X. Uh, so you like the integers or like the complex numbers? I guess both. Well, only one of those works. I don't know. I guess I'm confused what we're supposed to be thinking about. I mean, so we're thinking yes. about rings where you can do division with remainder. So in one of those, in one of these, you can do a division with remainder and in the other, you can't. Would it be C? X. Yes. So are there, are there any other examples where you can do division with remainders other than over the complex numbers? I mean, I know in the book it says Z of I. But, yeah, but I mean, that's that's this is going to be the example I told you. Uh, <laughs> so, for which rings have we just learned to do division with remainder, like at the beginning of the course? Uh, unique factorization difference. Tiago? Are you saying something, Tiago? I can't hear you. The ring of polynomials? Uh huh. Tiago, the... yeah, well, I'm not hearing what you're saying. Can you type? Polynomials over any ring, right, uh, over any field. <clears throat> not any ring, not over the integers. Um, okay, so the question that comes now is if if you're uh, if you're a polynomial, what is the valuation that I'm supposed to define? Oh, right. Um, sorry about the tell. Um, anyway. Um, what is what is the valuation of a the, polynomial? The degree, the degree of the polynomial. The degree. All right. Um, okay. Uh, all right. You will get a point, Tiago, and Sansar. 
I'm wrong. I, I don't know if I wrote that. Um, yeah, everyone was here at a point, so I don't need to get track. The degree, um, if you if you try to if you multiply two polynomials, as you know very well, the degrees add. They don't multiply. A polynomial of degree four can have a factor of degree three. Uh, but either way, this is bigger than the degree of either of them. Oh, wait, no. I'm, I'm messing up here because I, I said I didn't want to allow. Um, I said I didn't want to allow anything to have to go to zero. And a lot of things have degree zero. So let's say degree of p plus one. Uh, I mean, essentially, the degree worked. Um, I think the, the more reasonable thing to say is to say the two to the degree of p. Maybe let's say that. But I mean, obviously, the idea is that you're just looking at the degree. Let's say two to the power of the degree of p. So the ordering is the same. You still, you know, if if two polynomials have one has bigger degree than the other, two to the degree is still two to the degree is still bigger than the other. So if you do, if you multiply two polynomials, um. All right, sounds good to <clears throat> You have the degree of the product, which is the sum of the degrees because we're over a field. And this is the product of the, of the valuations. And this is, of course, bigger than or equal than to the degree of just p. Can we hear you now, Teo? All right, you can you can type. I'm I'm seeing that pops up in my phone. <clears throat> okay. Uh, the book says, just says that the, um, oh, the book is lying to us. The book says that the degree is evaluation, but that is not how they define evaluation because evaluation can't be zero. Yeah. Okay. So, um, again, we know how to do division with remainder for and the division with remainder exactly says the remainder has a smaller degree than the denominator okay right. so these are the two main examples of Euclidean domains um so, um, any questions? Okay, so, um, so I'm gonna give you another example. Yeah, so basically I was saying the, the real polynomials, um, what, if, I, if you just say two to the degree, uh, just so you never get the value of zero, you still have the property that when you multiply the degrees, well, now they multiply instead of instead of adding if you just put them in the exponents. But they, they still increase, which is an important bit. And just remembering that we can, for any two polynomials, we can divide them and the remainder is smaller than the denominator, has smaller degree. And that's all we need. That makes it a Euclidean domain. So now, why care about Euclidean domains? Um, 
why care is, an, is a question you should be asking all the time. Um, so the thing is that every Euclidean domain is a principal ideal domain. And let's just, uh, let's just show that real fast. Uh, so, let R be a Euclidean domain. With valuation um, new. And so, I need to show that it's a principal ideal domain. The way to show that it's a principal ideal domain is to take an ideal and show that it's principal. So, um, how do I know? So, I need to find a generator. I need to find the element with the most chance to generate the whole ideal in there. So, what is the element? Uh, so, what what am I supposed to do here? If you remember how we showed that polynomial ring is a BID, you might have that's. I mean, it's the same idea. So for the um, for polynomial can rings, the, can you use like the valuation as a generator or something like that? You gotta use evaluation somehow. Um, so what we know, what I know is that everything in the ideal has a valuation, has a, a size, has a value. So using evaluation, what can I pick in there? You can use the smallest valuation. The smallest valuation, exactly. So that's that's the key to everything, um, which is why it's very important that valuations are whole numbers. Otherwise, why would there be a smallest one? Take the element, let's say it's called A in I with the smallest valuation. So, um, so this is so this is going to be generate. This is going to be the generator of I. And that's gonna that's all we need. So, um, what we need to show. So. that I is contained in the ideal generated by A, uh, because since A, since A is in the ideal, any multiple of A is gonna be in the ideal as well. So, um, we need to show that any element in the ideal is a is a multiple of a. So if I want to show that b is a multiple of a, and what I know is that r is a Euclidean domain, what can I do? Can you use the uh, we we have b is equal to q times a plus r? That is exactly what we're supposed to do. Yes. 
Um, we use the vision, the, the tool at our, our disposal, which is the vision with remainder. So either, so if B doesn't divide A, then there's a remainder. Uh, A is BQ plus R and nu has smaller valuation than A. So this is supposed to be a contradiction. Where's the contradiction here? There's, since B is a multiple of A, right? Since it's in the ideal, so R is zero. No, we don't know B is a multiple of it. We, we're trying to prove that. Well, we're trying to prove that our oh, 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 I skipped it. I went straight to it being principal. Well, we know, so what we need to use is that B is in the ideal and A is in the ideal as well. Relation of R would be greater. That's kind of what we're trying to show that the valuation of R cannot actually be smaller than the valuation of A. Uh, we gotta get there somehow. Yeah, because you're already assuming that um, A has the smallest valuation in I. So right. Then the valuation of R can't be smaller than A, so it's a contradiction. Well, yes, basically, but I'm saying A has the, small, the smallest valuation out of the elements in I. So the question is, is R in I? It's not the smallest valuation everywhere. It's just the smallest valuation out of the things in the ideal. So if R happens to be in the ideal, so. Well, so, then mm -hmm. can't we say that R is equal to uh, B, my, or I'm sorry, uh, A minus B, Q. Yes, so that's, so now everything you said, uh, so we prove what Mason said first and then what John said, and that's the proof, yes. Uh, so R is A minus B, Q. Since B is in the ideal, any multiple is in the ideal. And A is in the ideal. So the sum of two things in the ideal or the, the difference is in the ideal. So R is in the ideal. Now, uh, new R smaller than new of A is a contradiction. Like John just said, because A has the smallest valuation in I. So um, R must be zero. So B, uh, A divides B as, and, and that's it. So this shows that the ideal is contained in the principal ideal. Uh, and I is the principal ideal. <clears throat> and that finishes the proof. So to recap, we wanted to show that an ideal is principal. What you gotta do is choose the elements with the smallest valuation in there. And that is guaranteed to generate the ideal because uh, if it didn't, if something else in the ideal wasn't a multiple, you could just take the remainder. The remainder is an operation that stays within, stays within the ideal because of this business. Uh, so the valuation actually cannot get any smaller because we said that A is the smallest and that's it. Nothing can have a remainder when you divide by A. Everything divides, everything is a multiple of A and the ideal uh, is generated by A. Any questions?
Okay, so I think we should still be a bit like, so if you, if you go back to the examples. Um, so now I know that every Euclidean domain is a principal ideal domain. And I guess um, I already know, so Euclidean domains are PIDs and we know that all of these are UFDs. So every Euclidean domain is a unique factorization domain as well. Uh, because, wait, I have a question. Yeah. Um, shouldn't the, on the, on the bottom of the left side, we have A is equal to B Q plus R. Shouldn't that be um, B is equal to A Q plus R because- uh, Oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, I just, yeah. Thank you. Oh. Right, so I'm trying to divide B by A. Oh my God, great catch. Um, Ooh, all of these are upside down. Uh, a minus the uh, poof. What, what am I? <laughs> Dividing B by A. Oh my God. All right. Um, Grayson, you're going to get another bonus point because uh, I really needed to get caught. Uh, okay. So if if you probably a lot of you were confused by that, you should have said something because well obviously I make mistakes. <laughs> and when when you're confused about something, normally the rest of the people of the class are as well. Right. Uh yeah, I think I said it out loud correctly. You divide B by A and the valuation of the remainder is more than the valuation of the thing you're dividing by. Okay. So, um, you claim domains are PIDs and PIDs have unique factorization. Uh, so every, anytime you find a Euclidean valuation, you get basically all the properties with all the dominoes fall. All the properties here we talked about come out for free. Um, so, I mean, the thing is the examples, so the examples we have, well, they're fields, which we are not really learning anything about fields here. Nothing that, nothing that we didn't know already. There's the integers that we knew the integers were PADs. We know every idea of the integers is just the multiples of a given number. And we know we knew polynomials are PAD. I and mean, we kind of did the same proof, but kind of not adding anything new. So let me add an, another example of Euclidean domain. Uh, so I think the, the main example of Euclidean domain comes from these sort of integers and then some algebraic number. Um, so um, let's show that the Gaussian integers are Euclidean domain. <clears throat> so the valuation, I think I've talked about this before. The valuation is the, um, that we should be taking is the square of the absolute value. Uh, so a complex number, which by the way, is the, the number times it's gone to get. We could, I mean, we could try to talk about I mean, it wouldn't matter if we're just talking about the usual absolute value of the complex number, which is the square root of this, but I just like it better if it's an integer. So, um, right, so I need to show
that when you multiply, the valuation can only increase. Uh, well, the thing about the absolute value is that it, it's multiplicative, right? Um, I think this is something this is something you know about complex numbers that when you multiply to complex numbers, the absolute value gets multiplied. Um, or you could just write it out and you'll see that it works. And also you're multiplying by something that's at least one. So Um, when you multiply two numbers, you're multiplying by the absolute value of the second number, which definitely makes it bigger. I mean, that's the that, so that's the easy property. <clears throat> okay, any questions? So now what I need to show is that I can I can do division with remainder. So for all I want to say um, any two numbers there exists um, well with the valuation of the remainder smaller than the valuation of B. So that's what we need to show, to show that it's a clear into main. Um, and this is, uh, it's tricky. Um, you know, for, Hello. Hello. Wow, you're you're back. I got it. Yes. <laughs> right. Just in time. Okay. Um, so we gotta somehow choose, you know, choose Q1, Q2 very carefully, I guess, uh, to get the right remainder. So the trick here is to, you know, all these numbers they're only allowed to be integers, but to for a second look at rational numbers and then I go from there. So so do you remember how to divide um, how to divide complex numbers? I can hear the background noise. I think using the, well, we're not going to use polar form, right? But an easier way to do it, I think I remember, is just putting them in their polar form. Okay. Right? Because yeah. then you add their angles and multiply their, modu their modulus, but you know. <laughs> yeah, that works, but I don't want to mess with that now. Um, if you convert the denominator to its, you know, the, I think the inverse, isn't it? Um, complex conjugate over uh, the magnitude squared. That would yeah, yeah. Oh, so no, you multiply the denominator by its conjugate and then you have. Um, uh, yeah, so integer. On the I mean, both of both things you said are, are correct. Um, they lead you to the same place. So you want to, I mean, I is just a square root, right? It's also how you, if you had like one plus root two in the denominator, you would do the same thing to get rid of the square root. You, you can, <clears throat> if you wanna, you wanna divide complex numbers, you make the denominator real by multiplying and dividing by the conjugate. 
so this is going to be uh well the thing this is going to be something it doesn't really matter what it is um all the thing everything anything but that matters is that this is p1 squared plus b2 squared so a natural number positive natural number and then there's some numbers here and i can write this as uh And what I have are two fractions. So what I've achieved is I can I can I can do the addition if I allow myself rational coefficients. So <clears throat> right a plus a one plus a two i divided by b one plus b two i as as a combination of rational numbers. And what I would like to do, um, ah, it's not gonna work, is it? Um, and I'm gonna have time. So what I want to do, I want to write C1, C2 as, the closest uh, integer plus a fraction uh, smaller than one half in absolute value. So instead of um, instead of taking the what do you call it the floor. Um, I want to take, I want to round to the closest number and get something, well, get it as two integers. And then two numbers that are going to be the most one half. So for example, if I wanted to do 17 16 16, write it as one plus one sixteenth. But if I wanted to do 15 16, don't write it as zero plus something, write it as one minus a small fraction. And, and from here, it turns out um, taking this equation, multiplying by b1 plus b2i is, um, I mean, that's pretty much it. Should I, uh, should I finish it in one? Let's just do it. So from here, from here and here, you can do a1, a2i divided by b1 plus b2i. So you multiply by the denominator on both sides. And what you get, What you get is on the left side, you get the original number I'm trying to divide. And here you have a quotient, you have your denominator and you have a remainder. And now you notice that the valuation of the remainder is the valuation of gamma one plus gamma two i, but not squared. Well, it's the product of valuations. Uh, which is gamma one plus gamma two squared times the valuation of the second thing. But now gamma one squared plus gamma two squared, the thing is these were fractions, um, they are tiny numbers. Uh, they're smaller than one half. So this is smaller than one fourth plus one fourth, which is 
uh, a most one half. So we're pretty much done. Uh, well, all right, I, I'm gonna have to go through this on Monday. I got some ambitious. All right, um, we're free to ask me any questions or otherwise.